All right. Um, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Maribeth Black, and I'm a food security analyst working with the World Food Program's Mobile Vulnerability Analysis and Mapping, or MVAM team. So we're happy that you've joined us today. We uh, heard already that there's about 45, 50 people already on the line. Um, so today we're hosting a webinar entitled Collecting Mobile Data Responsibly. And what we want to do is we want to explore with you what WFP, the World Food Program, as well as other actors operating in the humanitarian and development sectors um, are doing in terms of collecting mobile data and ensuring its protection. So we shared the invitation. We have a great lineup of panelists here to chat with you today. Um, just to quickly introduce them, the first we have um, Asif Niazi and Raul Kumba, who are joining us from the World Food Program Iraq country office, where they are both vulnerability analysis and mapping or VAM officers. We have Mika Michaela Bonsignorio, who is the World Food Program Global Advisor on Protection and Accountability to affected populations. We have Angie Lee, who is a World Food Program MVAM food security analyst, who played a very key role in the development of WFP's data responsibility field book. And last but not least, we have Jos Behrens, who was formerly part of the International Data Responsibility Group and is a data policy offer, officer with OCHA, or the Office of Coordinated Humanitarian Assistance. So we're, for the next hour or so, we're going to chat with our panelists about mobile responsible motor, mobile data collection at the field level within WFP's VAM unit or vulnerability analysis and mapping context globally across the World Food Program. And then also hearing from, from Yas about what happens in the broader humanitarian and development sphere. If you have questions at any point during the webinar, there's a chat function housed within the webinar, or you can tweet your question using the hashtag AskVam, so A-S-K-V-A-M, AskVam. We may not have time to cover all of your questions during the webinar, but that said, if we don't, we will include responses to all of your questions as well as share some additional resources on our MVAM blog, which is mvam.org. We'll also have a recording of the webinar. So if your internet connection and wherever you might be is not strong enough, um, feel free to tune in to the mvam.org blog later where we'll have a recording of what we're talking about today. So without further ado, thanks for tuning in today, this afternoon or morning. Um, I'm going to first turn it over to our Iraq colleagues, Asif and Raul, and they're going to provide you with a, an overview on what mobile data collection looks like within conflict settings, and in this case, specifically within Iraq. So, Asif and Raul, can you tell us a little bit about how does mobile data collection for WFP work in Iraq? What are some of the challenges that you're facing? And what measures have you put in place to mitigate and or address these challenges specifically to data privacy and data protection? And then finally, are there any gaps in the data collection or analysis? So over to you guys as I get your PowerPoint up on the screen. Thank you, Mary Beth. We see our um our PowerPoint on the, on, on the system, so I'll start. I'm Asif Niazi, I'm the head of the VAM and m and &E unit in Iraq, and I'm joined by, uh, with um, Raul Pumba, who's our VAM officer. We have been uh, told we're gonna keep our presentations very brief so that there's more time for discussion and, um, and questions and answers. Um, we're basically going to move through these slides. Um, I think we can move into the second slide here and start with the overview. The background in Iraq is that we've had a massive war going on here, and um, there was an, uh, what we call ISIL, which is the party that took over one third of the country. And uh, we were trying to do assessments of that area where they had captured uh, and uh, taken control from the Iraqi government. 
This happened in uh, June of 2014, but by February of 2015 is when we actually explored the MVAM option and then made a decision to move into it. And since 2015, February, every month the MVAM reports have been published and uh, they have been circulated pretty widely and uh, taken up by news media and also the UN agencies, other UN agencies as well. So that has been the um, major benefit of trying to move into MVAM. I'll just go into the challenges um, to start with, if we can go to the next slide. In the beginning, we started with uh, collecting data for every two months, we used to collect data from the uh, hard to reach areas, which are areas occupied by the, by the uh, ISIL um, forces. And then by the third month, we would collect nationwide data. So that way we, we had nationwide data to compare the hard to reach areas data from. Um, but as the conflict became more intense and there was many more displaced people in many more difficult areas to cover, we made a decision to get collect all the data on er, in every month from the conflict area and that we ran that for about a year and a half that way we had a series of data for all the conflict reflected areas um, on a monthly basis now what are the challenges of course the basic challenge was access that means these are areas where we cannot send in either our own monitors or our own assessors but we couldn't even use third party monitoring staff to go into these areas. And that's why we had to resort to MBAM. MBAM was the only option to us. And uh, we were the only agency that could do that. And the other agencies were actually looking at us for that kind of information. The second uh, limitation that we had to deal with was which, which is the service provider because there are several um, telephone companies that operate and we had to actually look at what our requirements were. We wanted to be able to talk to the to the poorest segment of society. And therefore we had to look at the agents, the service provider that had most subscription amongst the poor. Now, how do you do that? What criteria do you look into? Um, uh, of course, the, the subscription costs and the cost per telephone call that they would charge of their subscribers was, it was an important factor to us. But then the cost that they would charge us for this kind of service was also taken into consideration. The second criteria was the, of course, the coverage. I mean, not all telephone companies had, had very good coverage. Some of them were strong in coverage in the north, but they were weak in the south. And that kind of consideration had to be, had to be taken out, had to be considered. Um, and finally, the, the, the length of the questionnaire, because in a telephone conversation, uh, you have to have a very, very uh, tight script. And the training that we provided to these people was that they, they had to uh, stick to the script and collect information uh, accordingly. Every month we would of course revisit the script and sometimes we would change it based on feedback from other agencies and our own program unit. But primarily the script had to be very, very tight because there's no chance, there's not, there's not a lot of time to um, have lengthy conversations in it. And finally in, in the ISIL controlled areas of Mosul, it was actually illegal uh, for the public to use phones. And that created a big issue for us. I mean, are we putting people at risk by calling them up and asking them questions about food security or anything in an area that's controlled by a hostile uh, forces, uh, which would see people who are using phones or even using internet as, as a threat to their, to their rich. So that's one of the things that we had to be really considerate of. Okay. Now we move a little bit into the uh, measures. I mean, yes, we, what did we do? We tried to find the um, service provider with the lowest cost. Um, we had to have rather lengthy conversations with the, with the other partners who were looking for information and explain to them why we're limited uh, and how come the questions have to be very straightforward and very simple. Um, because we have, uh, we needed to be able to communicate with the people at the other end of the phone who didn't have a lot of time, but and, and we couldn't offer a lot of explanations to what these questions are coming from. Uh, one of the things we had to do was that we, we divided to our work uh, over uh, food security component and the other was to cover the market component. In food security component, um, it's basically respondents are households, 
and for the cover, for the markets, of course, they were traders. So there was a different ball game going on between the two. So therefore, we had different training modules for the people who were conducting these interviews and uh, the different kind of briefings for them. So we had to look at these both angles. Now we move into the benefits. The main benefit, I mean, what we see is that we had near real-time assessments. Now, as the war progressed and new areas were liberated by the Iraqi army, the very next day we could conduct our survey. And so within a 24 hour turnaround, we would be able to tell our program units, but also the other UN agencies and also the media on what the food security of that particular village or that particular part of the city that's been liberated a day before, we could be able to tell them. And that was the probably the best um, scenario because um, the other agencies didn't have that access and therefore really relied on whatever we could provide for them. So WFP became a main provider of information for all the agencies. And, uh, and that was acknowledged uh, by, by the other UN agencies and the RC and the other um, uh, coordinating bodies that were looking and seeking for information. Um, finally, um, I just wanted to add one more thing on uh, data security. One of the concerns was that our data was in the hands of a private company. We were asking for a private company that's basically in the business of telecommunications to talk to people on our behalf, collect information from them and uh, tell them and give them the confidence that this data will remain um, without any breach and it will remain within WFP and that it will not be shared outside. So that's something that we, uh, was a concern that uh, data security, actually the data comes into a private company before it actually gets becomes our data. Uh, and that was the one of the things that we had to um, consider carefully and what kind of questions we can ask and uh, who at the end is monitoring whether this data is actually getting out or not. So I guess that's um, all we wanted to say from our side. Um, Raul, do you wanna add something? Okay, so I guess we can leave more time for the other presenters and also for questions. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you both very much for, for your comments. Maybe just one follow up. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about the data ownership between the private sector company with which you're working, who's collecting the information and the WFP Iraq country office. But are there any other measures that you've put in place or taken into account, as you said, to make sure that the data doesn't fall into the wrong hands? Um, what kind of data privacy measures have you talked about, put in place? Uh, how do you protect the data, et cetera? Thanks, guys. Our concern for data privacy was, of course, uh, put into the TORs when we had asked for proposals from these different uh, service providers. So it was not only verbal, but it was written. And then finally, when the contract was drawn up, uh, it was very, very, very implicit about this and very careful to dictate, to tell them how serious we are about the uh, about the data confidentiality. Um, those are the two steps that we took. And then we followed up by trying to ask around um, while we were into the MVAM process, whether there was any um, reports where the our data somehow has made its way into other hands. We did not really receive anything of uh, to suggest that it was, um, but again, we, we have to remember that we had to be very careful about what kind of questions we're asking, because no matter what steps we would take for prevention, there may be a breach at any stage. And therefore, we have to be careful not even to collect information that might that any breach would actually put somebody in uh, under threat. Over. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your response. Uh, once again, if you have any questions for the Iraq country office, please feel free to either write them in the chat function or to tweet them on Ask Vam, and we'll address them in a few moments. So now I'm going to turn it over to Angie Lee, who is a VAM officer of vulnerability analysis and mapping officer based in HQ, and who helped develop the MVAM data responsibility field book.
Now this field book maps out what elements staff from WFP as well as other organizations should consider when they're setting up and deploying mobile uh, data collection systems. So Angie, over to you, what can humanitarian staff expect to find in the data responsibility field book? And do you have any tips and or guidance that you could provide? Uh, thanks, Mary Beth. Um, I don't know up the slides, but uh, yeah. while you do, right, um, let me first uh, start with a quick reality check, right? So, um, as you all know, uh, WFP collects and processes and stores large amounts of data. Uh, there are reportedly over 20 million records on scope which is WFP's central platform for managing beneficiary identity information. And um, many of you may also be familiar with our market monitor, which provides uh, up-to-date price information of uh, staple commodities uh, collected from over 1,500 markets uh, across the globe. And just in the past year alone, over 200,000 questionnaires were administered uh, using MVAM. So uh, conducting assessments and surveys uh, has always been our bread and butter work for the last couple of decades. But with such large volume of data coming in, um, we really had to think hard about uh, finding a solution to safely uh, store and manage all that data. Um, so I'm not seeing the slides myself. Mary Beth, can you can you see if the slide is uh, on the second page? The slides are here and on slide number two for me. So hopefully our participants as well as other panelists can see them as well. Okay. Um, so um, we at WFP believe in responsible open data. Uh, we have built a management system, which is based on a public API that uh, shares um, data automatically. And we also build open and interactive um, website. And we're also closely collaborating uh, with we Ucha. We and can't hear. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? I think everyone, uh, panelist-wise, except our colleagues in Iraq, Angie. So, Iraq team, maybe refresh the browser and nope. come back in, and Angie, keep talking. Okay. I don't know whether I should. Um... Okay, so I, I've been told that you guys can still hear me. I will continue. <laughs> um, I was talking about how uh, we have this uh, open um, interactive website where we, where we share our data. Um, and we also collaborate with OCHA's Humanitarian Data Exchange. And in doing all of this, data privacy and data security are our top priority. We only share aggregate data. And, um, we don't provide any uh, phone numbers or any uh, private uh, information that is uh, identifiable to any individual. So these are some of the best practices that uh, we have uh, adopted to make sure that when we go for open data, uh, it is responsible open data. All right. Now, um, but is this good enough? And I look back at the pre-digital uh, era uh, with a bit of nostalgia, to be uh, frank, uh, when we were collecting data by administering um, paper questionnaires in the field, and which had to be typed in manually by a data entity clerk, and um, that had to be cleaned before we could analyze it. Now, one would argue that during those times, uh, we had more direct control throughout the process. Papers could be rescinded after they've been used, and data sets could be stored safely in a VAM officer's pen drive or uh, stored in a desktop. But that said, um, based on my personal experience, it was also more than often the case that uh, one would forget uh, what kind of data sets were still sitting in someone's pen drive that was floating around. 
and also what kind of targeting database uh, was still sitting on a desktop in a in a remote uh, field office. So uh, fast forward now, we are increasingly uh, relying more and more on um, all these digital tools and automated processes. And uh, we're collecting data through these tools and processes en masse. And the risks and stakes are therefore much higher and much higher ever than before, actually. So we really had to ask ourselves some hard questions. Uh, just last month, uh, there were reports uh, about a platform that was hosting beneficiary data of at least 11 major international NGOs and UN organizations uh, was uh, subject to uh, security breaches. And here we're really talking about um, thousands of people's photos, PIN numbers, uh, locations, um, all of this being exposed. And one expert actually uh, said in an op-ed piece that um, what's unique about this Red Rose incident is not the fact that data breach was possible, but actually that this incident was publicly reported. And uh, the reality is that these kind of breaches uh, happen at all levels, unbeknownst, uh, and these risks are for real. Uh, we thus felt the need to uh, raise the awareness of our colleagues working in the field and, and, and handling and working with data as part of their everyday work and bring their attention to this uh, critical issue. Uh, is the uh, slide flipping? Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So coming to the field book. Um, a corporate policy on data security and privacy has been defined by WFP back in 2012, and my colleague Michaela will speak to that uh, specifically in a moment. Um, the field book in particular was developed as a complementary resource uh, to really uh, provide some practical tips and guidance to our uh, colleagues uh, in the field. Now, uh, I don't think I have the time to dive into the, the field book at length here, but just to give you a sneak preview of, uh, of what we are looking at, um, we examined the entire data uh, life cycle uh, from collection to storage um, to disposal, and we examined the risks uh, and uh, the corresponding mitigation measures that we can take uh, at each uh, and every stage of this uh, data um, life cycle, if you like. For example, before collecting data, uh, we would want to make sure that the data collection has a specific purpose and that we are designing surveys on a really need-to-know basis. Also, ideally, uh, we would want to conduct a privacy impact assessment, which uh, is there to help to identify, evaluate, and uh, come up with uh, mitigation measures um, for risks that are related to processing personal uh, data. Uh, we also uh, want to make sure that when we're outsourcing uh, mobile data collection to a third-party service provider, these are the right providers to work with. Uh, Azif and Raul talked about this before. Um, when we actually come to the actual uh, data collection phase, um, we seek informed consent, and this uh, is uh, not just uh, merely ticking off the box. It really involves working close with the communities and communicating properly to uh, the vulnerable groups and, and individuals that, that we are uh, uh, working with. We also want to be extra mindful in um, in conflict settings. Uh, for example, um, doing SMS surveys, uh, SMS uh, text messages, they leave a large digital footprint, and these might uh, cause harm to, to specific vulnerable groups and individuals, especially in conflict settings. Now, after uh, having collected the data, we want to make sure that uh, it's safely stored. And uh, we are really aiming for a privacy by design principle here. And um, we also want to make a distinction between data that uh, can be made available open and public and data that should be disposed of at the end of, of a specific project uh, whose purpose has been met. And 
last but not least, in case data breach does occur, uh, we want to make sure that we act upon it. So uh, we want to make sure that these incidents are reported and there is a case management system in place and um, appropriate action uh, is taken according to ideally an already existing contingency plan that lays out what kind of um, measures should be taken in the event of a security breach. So all of these um, uh, principles and uh, best practices uh, have been put together in the field book. And I must emphasize that this is by means uh, um, an exhaustive list. And uh, we hope that, uh, or we would expect that many of you are already applying these uh, best practices, if not all of them, as part of your or of your daily work, uh, whether consciously or, or whether as, as a good practice. Um, but we really hope that this field book can, can start the conversation and, and build an internal dialogue about data responsibility uh, and serve as a vehicle so that we can share lessons learned and practice these um, best practices uh, at all levels at all times. And um, so I don't know whether you can all see the last slide, but uh, I've quickly put together some links where you can actually find um, the actual data field responsibility uh, guide book. Um, but also there are other resources that you can consult on this topic. Um, we have a remote food security monitoring online course that you can also visit at your own time. And we would also encourage you to uh, look up the signal code by Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, articulates a human rights approach to information during humanitarian crisis. I think my time is up. Uh, hand it over to Mary Beth. Thank you, Angie. And for those of you that didn't have a chance to jot down these different web addresses and links, um, we will provide them to you in the chat function and they will also be on the MVAM blog for you to look at following the webinar. Um, so now we are going to hear from Michaela, who's going to share some details on the World Food Program's corporate data privacy and security policies. So Michaela, what are the key messages within our data privacy and security policy for which development and humanitarian practitioners should be aware? Um, what are the, some of the common questions you receive or what are the types of guidance that you provide to WFP staff conducting, mo conducting mobile data collection? So Michaela, I'm gonna get your slides up and over to you. First of all, um, the Murphy's Law says that uh, when you're on a webinar with 100 people on your activity feels a bit, so can you please just confirm that you can hear me? Michaela, we can hear you, but it's breaking up just a little bit. Okay, it looks like we've uh, temporarily lost Michaela there. Michaela, can you say something now? Let's see if you're connected. Otherwise, we'll go to Yas and we'll jump back to you in a few yeah. moments. Okay, can you hear me? Can hear you, but you're, you're breaking in and out a little bit there. Can you hear me? Not very well. Because I can't hear. <sighs> okay, why don't you go out of the webinar so room and come so back in? And I will go ahead and skip over to our fourth panelist. If Yas, if you're ready on your end, um, and then we'll go back to Mich Michaela at the end, assuming that she has a better connection. So. I'm good. Can you hear me, Mary Beth? I can hear you loud and clear. So, so we'll go back, Michaela, we'll go back to you in just a moment. Let's see if your connection sorts out. Um, for those of you listening in, we are on multiple continents today, so it makes it sometimes a bit tricky. I'm gonna turn it over to Yas. Uh, 
Yoss, as we said before, is works worked with the International Data Responsibility Group, and he's currently an officer with the Office of Coordinated Humanitarian Assistance, or OCHA. So Yoss, if you could take a few moments to talk to us about the broader landscape of data responsibility norms and best practices. Um, we'd like to hear what types of discussions are taking place at the international level, who, who's participating in these discussions, and what type of guidance is available to people looking to do mobile remote data collection. Thanks, over to you. Thank you, Mary Beth, and thanks for uh, having me on this uh, on this panel, uh, which I think is uh, is very timely and uh, appropriate given the both the increase in data collection and use in the humanitarian space, and also uh, the growing uh, what I would see as growing uh, risks and and threats to uh, data that's been collected. Um, so, as you said, I work with uh, OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, and in particular, I work with the Center for Humanitarian Data established in The Hague and uh, which is about to be officially launched uh, Friday next week, the 27th, by our Secretary General, Mr. Guterres. Um, so we're uh, really excited to uh, to have him over and, uh, and come launch the center. Um, and I think uh, I will uh, give a sort of brief introduction um, of uh, the, the ongoing discussions, as you've said, on um, responsible uh, data collection. And I would go a bit further uh, than just uh, mobile data collection, which I think is one important uh, segment. Um, but of course, there's various various methods for uh, for collecting data. And uh, I think um, there is there's quite some overlap in uh, the responsibility issues uh, around mobile data collection and some of the more traditional uh, means for collecting. But maybe I can start off with a, a brief introduction of the center, just so that uh, our audience have an idea of, uh, of what we do here. Um, so as you can see uh, on this slide, we were established uh, with the mission uh, of connecting people and data uh, to improve lives. Um, as you can see here, um, up until very recently, construction was still um, uh, going on for our building. And uh, so we are uh, definitely still in, uh, in, in startup mode here and getting ready for uh, for the launch. And the center, uh, in terms of content, will focus on four areas of work. And the first of that was already mentioned by uh, my colleague Angie uh, earlier on this webinar. Um, and it's uh, the data services that we provide to the humanitarian community. And the most important service there, I would say, is uh, the Humanitarian Data Exchange, which is an online platform for humanitarian organizations to exchange uh, data they've collected with other humanitarian uh, actors, but also with a wider community. So we have about 6,000 data sets on there, uh, shared and, and used by, um, or shared by 300 uh, organizations. Um, then uh, the second stream of work is uh, data policy, which is the work stream I lead, and um, that falls into two components. One is uh, drafting a data policy for OCHA, uh, and the second uh, really is um, to work with partners on establishing data responsibility frameworks, so um, the, uh, the frameworks for sharing data uh, in an appropriate uh, manner. And the third work stream is data literacy. So we'll be uh, organizing um, workshops and uh, convenings um, to inform uh, humanitarian uh, staff, but also the wider community on responsible um, uh, data practices in uh, humanitarian response. And finally, we really aim to invest in um, the network uh, around humanitarian data sharing. Um, so because this is a an effort that, that can never be driven by, by one actor alone. So that, that just as a, a bit of background on the center, and maybe um, uh, now going into um, uh, the topic of this uh, webinar in particular. Um, so I would say we've really seen in the, in the past few years that the use of data and analytics, including uh, mobile data collection, has grown very rapidly in, uh, in humanitarian uh, response. And the, the impact of these technologies is really becoming very clear, as Angie just mentioned, uh, and also as mentioned by, um, by Asif and Raul in, in Iraq. Um, these new technologies for collecting information really give us uh, a, a new uh, sort of sensor into, um, uh, to, to gather the information uh, we need. But on the other hand, risks 
are also becoming more clear. Um, and one of the uh, sort of latest prominent examples was already mentioned by um, by Angie, which is uh, the data breach uh, of uh, Red Rose. Um, and I would say these data breaches are one type of threat uh, that definitely exists around data uh, in in humanitarian response. These sort of unwarranted. Um, uh, non-intentional release of uh, sensitive data. I think um, that is one very important uh, um, one, one very important threat. However, there is also another category of, of risk which falls more into the uninformed but still intentional release of information. And Angie also referred to this a bit, and it um, and it has to do with um, uh, staff releasing information on public platforms or with partners without um, being fully aware of the potential negative consequences of releasing uh, such information. Um, so that could be the release of um, uh, a certain um, affected communities' ethnicity, for example, which might not be very sensitive in one context, but is uh, sensitive in another context. Um, the same goes for uh, religious uh, beliefs that could be, um, that could be exposed. Um, so this, uh, as I mentioned, the risks of certain types of information uh, are context dependent. And another factor I would add there, uh, and this also comes from the sort of global discussions uh, on this topic, is that there is also a certain temporal dimension to, to risk. So information that is not sensitive right now could become sensitive as a context evolves, for example, as a conflict erupts. So this contextual and temporal dimension of risk are, are one of the things that, uh, that are currently being discussed um, in the international uh, uh, arena around this, around this topic. And together, I would say these dimensions uh, the dimension of temporality and, and contextuality make for a very high level of uncertainty regarding the sensitivity of humanitarian data. So it is often not very clear how sensitive data that we've collected and that we store actually is or, or can become. And given that uh, uncertainty, um, right now we are still in a sort of pre-dawn phase where there is not sufficient clarity uh, to determine um, uh, the sensitivity of the data set and therefore um, a certain amount of, uh, of restraint and uh, uh, caution is, is certainly uh, warranted. So I think that is one uh, of the takeaway points uh, that I would like to give to the audience here is that sometimes we just don't know how sensitive uh, a data set might be and therefore it's best to or on the on the side of caution. Um, I was asked to um, to say a bit more about the different communities um, uh, talking about uh, this subject, and uh, one of them was mentioned uh, uh, by Angie. Uh, it's the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, uh, and in particular, I would recommend our audience to um, uh, read the op-ed that they've written um, recently in uh, Iran News. Uh, as a response to um, the new story about the Red Rose data breach. Um, because in this op-ed, they really um, make it very clear in what sort of um, um, era we're living now regarding data responsibility, and, and they have some, uh, some great recommendations for, um, for, next, uh, uh, for next steps. Um, another community I would um, definitely want to highlight here is uh, or, or another uh, stream of work that's um, that's being developed is uh, done by UNHCR and the Danish Refugee Council together with whom we're working on uh, a framework for data sharing in practice and the idea of this framework is really to introduce a common language between humanitarian actors um, so that we can start exchanging data um, more easily so that we know what we mean if we use the word, uh, let's say, data or information, or um, if, we, if we use the word aggregation, so that we know that we speak the same language. So there is a set of definitions, there is a set of principles, and then there is a set of, uh, there, there is a shared process for data sharing, which includes uh, risk assessment um, and several other, other steps. 
And so this framework is currently under development uh, and will be uh, uh, released shortly. Um, and I can uh, definitely recommend our audience um, uh, to have a look uh, have a look at that. Now, in general, about this uh, sort of field of discussion, uh, data responsibility in, in humanitarian action, I would say it's particularly fruitful for collaboration between uh, the academia and uh, the international uh, public sector. Um, there's several examples of collaborations between uh, between the two. One example would be uh, ICRC, who have uh, uh, developed work together with uh, the Brussels Privacy Hub. Um, another example is uh, the International Data Responsibility Group, which I was uh, formerly a part of, um, which is also a collaboration between knowledge institutes, think tanks, and um, uh, the international uh, public sector. Uh, and, and there are several more of these uh, uh, examples because they're really, um, uh, in, in the humanitarian community, there really uh, is not yet the level of expertise needed often for, um, for uh, um, making truly informed decisions uh, around data sharing in particular and data sensitivity. Um, I think that's most of what I had to say, uh, and I look forward to uh, uh, Mikaela's presentation. Great, thank you so much, and thanks for the flexibility of switching switching around this morning. Um, Mikaela, it sounds like you're connected again, so if possible, I'll try to turn it back over to you. Once again, Mikaela's talking about WFP's corporate data privacy and security policies. So Mikaela, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, and sorry for for earlier. But uh, as I was saying, that's the Murphy's law. <laughs> when you are on a webinar, your connect your connection fails. So um, I'll go right into my presentation. So uh, you, as you may be aware, this year in January, uh, the end of January, uh, WFP has issued its uh, guidelines on personal data protection, uh, on privacy and, and personal data. Uh, protection. The guidelines aimed at uh, um, filling um, a gap, a quite dangerous gap, a vacuum that we had in the organization. If you can just think of, uh, of the fact that we are dealing, we are managing, uh, we are serving actually 80 million people, so 80 million uh, human beings um, whose identity and whose personal details are in our hands. We have expanded the network of our partners now we are no longer we are no longer um, working with the traditional partners but we are tapping into the private sector whose culture code of conduct and uh, corporate objectives are, are completely different from ours and we are proportionally uh, using I mean we are increasingly using uh, sensitive personal data like biometrics so all this has led us to um, uh, to the issuance towards the issuance uh, of this guide which, by the way, are very much aligned uh, to the MVA guidelines on collecting mobile data uh, responsible. So um, these guidelines are set forth by principles. Uh, the first one, the first principle is. Oh, it looks like Michaela disappeared from the chat. Um, let's give her just one minute. Thanks for your patience. Let's see if she gets back in. If not, then uh, we will go ahead and start asking some questions. And we will share her PowerPoint as well as some of her resources on the MVAM blog afterwards. Um, looks like she's not coming back in, but um, we'll hopefully be able to get our other colleagues back in the group. Um, some of the challenges of multi-continental web webinars here in real time. Um, all right, so I can hear you. Oh, Michaela, it doesn't even look like you're in the webinar, but why? Can anyone else? Can the other panelists? Can you hear Michaela? I can hear you. Okay, keep going oh. then. Can you hear me? Yep, Michaela, I can hear you, and so can the other panelists. So why don't you okay. continue? 
speaking. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so first principle is lawful and fair collection and processing means that uh, we have to we have to respect uh, basically the do no harm approach, and making sure that uh, collection and the utilization of personal data do not expose our beneficiaries to any further harm. And uh, this is also in line with our protection uh, pre uh, policy, which was issued in 2012. It also means that we have to seek the informed consent of our, uh, of our, of the people we serve before uh, we undertake data collection. Uh, informed consent means that we have to take the time to inform them about who we are, why we are, why we are collecting this data, so the purpose that we're gonna make of it, and who this will be shared with, and what are the mechanisms that they, they can use to contact us and, um, and uh, report any concern or request any, any action that they want to make, they want to take uh, with regard, with respect to their data. Um, third principle is data quality. Data quality, um, the main two aspects of data quality are uh, one, that uh, we need to uh, be careful with what we collect. So we shouldn't collect what we like or what is funky, but we should, we should just collect what is needed. And this is, this may be, may seem obvious, but um, oftentimes, uh, it's not. We are, over, we overwhelm ourselves with a lot of data that in the end we cannot even, um, we do not even have the capacities to process. So that is fundamentally wrong and dangerous because it can expose, we are exponentially, um, uh, we are, exposing our uh, the people we serve to uh, to further dangers also there's always a risk of data bias and i would say that in mobile data collect collection it's probably even higher this risk because as you can know access to technology varies across uh, um, across countries across, across regions and it's affected by multiple factors like end gender age disability uh, whether you're urban or um, or rural dweller and so and so so forth and so on um, participation and accountability wfp recognizes people's right uh, to participate in the decision that affect their lives. So this applies also for data uh, protection. It means that uh, we should always engage with the local population and just listen to what they to what they to what they think and to what they fear with regard to um, to their data protection. And of course, we should make sure that we factor in these fears in uh, in the way we operate. And then data security. Well, it's it goes. Uh, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about data security. We need to make sure that we adopt state of the art data security measures to ensure that. Um, the data do not wrong, do not fall in the wrong hands. As a consequence of these principles, we have two further, two further, um, things that need to be taken into account. Every time we share data with uh, another entity, we need to make sure that we have the consent of people. We need to make sure that we only share the data that are, uh, that are necessary to fulfill that purpose. And, um, and we, uh, we have to be covered by, uh, by a data uh, sharing agreement. Um, challenges. What are the main challenges in mobile data col collection? Well, this, the first point I just wanted to reiterate, but I, I think I, I'm going to skip this because it's, it was addressed quite widely. But I'm going to reiterate that the underpinning rationale for data protection is avoiding, is about avoiding that personal data of the people we serve fall in the wrong hands. We may have a lot of, in, uh, in a given context, we may have a lot of entities interested in making, making new, in seizing in personal data for non-humanitarian purposes. So we really need to take care of, uh, uh, to take every, every action mitigation measures to avoid that. The second point that I wanted to, um, to highlight is, um, are we really aware of the real amount of personal information that, that are involved when we are, when we undertake, uh, an, an initiative that, uh, that of course, uh, builds on data protection? And I'm, Talking for, for mobile data collection, I would say that uh, probably sometimes we tend to believe that it's just the, the content of the message of the survey that we do that uh, that is personal information. But that's not all. I mean, it's also the users the users' information that um, that they use. For example, when when we use Facebook, uh, the, we are requested to um, to release our 
birthday and our email, if I remember well. So this, this is an example of personal information, additional personal information that we should be aware of that is released, especially when we, when we outsource um, our mobile data collection to some companies. And we need to make sure that, uh, that we know what's going to happen to this information. And then all the metadata that is generated, for example, when we, every time, uh, we use a mobile phone. There's a lot of information on the information that is generated, like from where I'm calling to where I'm calling, who am I calling at what time. These are all information. It's a sort of gray area because it's not always recognized as personal information or it was not recognized as personal information, but it is definitely a personal information and it is definitely even more, maybe even more sensitive than the message content per se. Um, we must be aware of the fact that the risks increase as we re as we rely on outsourcing and this is the uh, it can be the case in mobile data um, collection we are dealing with uh, private partners in most of the cases that have different corporate policies and different objectives um, when we for example when we use mobile numbers that com I mean, uh, mobile network operate uh, operators have already in their possession. We need to make sure that they were lawfully um, obtained. We need to make sure where data uh, are going to be uh, stored because the physical, uh, the, the place where data are stored is particularly important when it comes to the application of our privileges and immunities and when it comes to uh, any possible attempt by authorities to seize or to request um, access, access to this uh, to this data we need to be sh we need to be uh, mindful of the fact that uh, our private partners may actually use this data for other purposes that are not exactly the original ones that we are agreed and in, many, in most of not not most but in many cases we need to remember that um, for example, messaging app companies, they, uh, they use, uh, they use other entities, uh, to, to be able, uh, to make their, uh, applications function. So these are all, um, these are all, let's say, considerations that need to be taken. Um, data quality and potential for bias and, uh, uh, discriminations that I said, as I said earlier, um, especially mobile data connection. There's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, potential bias that can uh, lead us to make mistakes and can lead us to discriminatory final decision, especially when it comes to allocation of aid resources. I think I, I skipped one, but I'll go back. Um, so these factors normally are related to gender, age, um, rural versus urban. Um, let's think of people that can be, whose access to technology is completely, let's say, almost impossible, like people living with, uh, um, with disability. I mean, all this, uh, all these uh, uh, factors need to be uh, need to be ensured. Just imagine that a recent survey from the World Bank uh, a couple of years ago um, showed that mobile subscription reached uh, one uh, uh, hundred fourteen percent of the of the population of in uh, high income countries, um, eighty six percent of the population in middle income countries, and forty two only in low income countries. Uh, usage of, inter of internet um, is even lower, uh, so 76% in high-income countries, 27% in mix, and 6% uh, in low-income countries. So it's just an example that can show, that can easily display the, the bias no? of, um, of th that can affect our final results. Also, data subjects' rights at stake, for, uh, question mark, um, data subjects, which are the people we serve and which are the people that release the inf personal information, are uh, have rights, and they are, and we need to respect them. The right to, the right to, um, to give their consent, the right to, the right to ask us, um, uh, to take action with regard to the, to their, uh, to their personal data, even the right to be forgotten, the right to be informed, okay? So, in an environment where there is limited uh, 
uh, human touch, let's say. I'm talking about, for example, those systems that use automated means. In an environment where we rely on external operators where that maybe do not have the right sensitivity or the right training. In an environment where there is limited um, digital literacy or language barriers, the open question is, are we really making any possible effort to ensure that people are duly informed, do understand correctly what we are talking about, and that they are enabled to opt out at any time they want? That's the open questions. And finally, there are also other protection concerns that we need to consider. For example, how do we react if while collecting and um, conducting these surveys, we come across a serious protection ex accident. People sometimes they are desperate to tell somebody about their problems. Do are we prepared to take these cases? How we do we know how to react? Do we know where to refer? This is something that, uh, of course, is not not only relates to mobile data collection, but relates. To WFP programs in general, but it is a protection concerns. Also, how do we manage the expectations? Are we creating too many expectations? Michaela, it sounds like you, you got cut off there. Um, I think you've, you've put a lot of great considerations on the table today of different aspects with the the challenges we face when trying to do mobile data collection and specifically some of the elements or key questions we should be asking ourselves as we prepare these types of remote data collection exercises. Um, I think uh, even if Michaela comes back in in the element of time, because I know everyone tuning in today is probably very busy. Uh, Michaela, I was just saying that you, you cut out again, but um, uh, you've put a lot of great questions on the table and perhaps in the element of time, um, mm -hmm. we can wrap up there. Um, we're getting yeah. a lot of really interesting questions from, yeah. from our participants today, which I've been told is over 75 people tuning in now. So um, for those of you that are asking questions, if your question is more related to mobile data collection and how you set that up and how you ensure different pieces of that, we, we, we promise we will answer your question. However, in the element of time, we're not going to do so now. We will do so on the MVAM blog. So anyone that has written in a question, we've documented it, we have it, and we'll be sure that one of our panelists and team members does respond to that question and the answer is provided on the MVAM blog. That said, I think there's two questions that we are going to address now. And the first question is going to go to our Iraq colleagues, who I hope can hear me here. Um, so Asif and Raul, um, one of the questions coming in for you is, how do we ensure the authenticity of the interviewee? Do we monitor the location of the mobile phone of the respondent? And then what protection elements go with ensuring their identity and monitoring their location. So, Iraq colleagues, I hope you could hear me. Um, over to you to respond to the question. Okay, thank you, Mary Beth. Um, re regarding these two questions, on the location, the service provider has a series of towers uh, which connect to the mic to the mobile phones. So what happens is that the service provider, in addition to knowing the, the telephone number and the name of the subscriber, also knows where that phone is pinging from. That means they know within a few uh, hundred meters uh, which one of their towers is actually connecting to the phone. So that's actually one of the strengths of the MVAM is that we, we, what we were able to do is that we could specify when a particular village was liberated to tell the phone uh, service company to uh, conduct their interviews in that area. So they programmed the computer to only uh, contact phone numbers that were within those particular towers. Uh, that way we could control and make sure the authenticity of that the interview is exactly coming from that particular location. Uh, the second is that the subscriber uh, would, uh, sorry, the, the, the interviewer would already have the name and the phone number of that subscriber, and therefore they would check um, with the, with them whether they're talking to the, to the same person or not. But uh, this again is a mobile phone thing, so it's uh, if somebody else is holding on to the phone, it is assumed that uh, the the principal subscriber has given 
consent to the to the person holding the phone to be answering in on their behalf. Over. Anything else? Okay, I can add something. Also, when we do, we check the output of the data or the analysis. We make sure that we see some some trend which makes sense. Okay, if we, we find that some of the food security indicator which we are collecting from that location doesn't make sense in one of this round of the M5, we make sure that we check what's going on because maybe we are addressing this question to wrong people. Okay, based on the repetition of the same survey or the same type of question, the same location can check if we are we are meeting the quality of the of the response which we are looking for. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you guys in Iraq for that response. Um, I think we'll go with one or two more questions before we wrap up here today. So the next question is for anyone who would like to answer, but it's talking about the design stage. So the question is, how do we integrate um, information security considerations during, during early phases of a survey, especially during survey data design and data collection? Yeah, I can give a first go at that, Marba. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think it's a really great question because it touches upon uh, various um, parameters that we should really um, consider when um, setting up a survey or designing a survey. Um, and I go for uh, data collection, we need to be very clear in our mind uh, what uh, the data collection is for. So the purpose has to be very specific. And we want to make sure that we design the surveys uh, on, the, on a need to know basis. So uh, we don't just go out and collect data because more data is good. Uh, there is also a lot of um, fatigue on, on the side of the, the communities and the individuals that we keep going back to, to collect more data. And then uh, at the end of the day, they don't even see the color of all the data that was collected and, and that's why we're also uh, making a lot of effort to push back the information and share the information back with the vulnerable communities. But not only that, it also touches upon the question of um, infrastructure, I mean, how to manage databases and, uh, and, and, uh, and making sure that the data is um, stored in, in a safe and secure environment. So there's definitely a, uh, uh, IT uh, element to it, and uh, I think uh, the industry practice is to really go for uh, privacy by design. So you make sure that when you set up uh, an information management system, you adhere to the utmost uh, data privacy and security standards. Last but not least, and this is something that we tend to um, easily overlook because we just take it for granted that we just can go into the field and collect data. There are some contexts where we have to really be careful of the local, uh, I mean, domestic laws and regulations. And in some countries, uh, um, government uh, asks for data that uh, is collected uh, through us or through uh, a third party um, NGO. Um, and if it's indeed the case, WFP should really make a conscious choice of going for data collection only if it feels comfortable sharing that type of information with the government. Because uh, we're also talking about uh, certain vulnerable groups or persecuted uh, groups of people who may want to hide their identity from, from the local authorities. So I think these are some of the important questions that we need to uh, take into consideration when we uh, go with uh, designing a survey and making sure that uh, we really um, make sure the information uh, security uh, measures are uh, in place. Over to you, Mary Beth. Great, so thank, thank you, Angie, for your response. We have a couple other panelists that would like to give their point of view. So Yas, I'll start with you and then Michaela, turn it over to you once he has finished, thanks. All right. Thanks, Mary Beth. And I'll keep it brief to give uh, Michaela a chance to respond as well. So um, I think just following up on on what Angie said, I think a couple of points that she uh, addressed lead into a, a larger uh, step, which is 
to do a really uh, thorough assessment of the context. And that, um, that includes a context uh, of the legal landscape in, uh, in the situation where you're planning to do your data collection, um, but also um, uh, an assessment of which actors are active and who might be interested in uh, getting, uh, getting their hands on your data and how could that be used against uh, the population you aim to survey. Um, but I would say even before that context assessment, there is an assessment uh, that, that, that should be done of what's already out there. Is, is this information already collected by some other party and could they just share it with us without us having to go out and collect it uh, themselves? Because thereby you would avoid um, this, this uh, survey fatigue that Angie mentioned, um, where you have to go again and again uh, to, uh, to collect sometimes the same, uh, the same data. So an assessment of the already existing information and then an assessment of the specific uh, contextual uh, sensitivities of the information you aim to collect, I think is, is really key. And then finally, um, a lean design of the survey and where you only ask the questions that you actually need to have answered. Um, I think that's the, the, the final step in that, uh, in that process. So thanks and uh, over to you, Michaela. Yes, well, basically you said it all. I just wanted to confirm that as part of the, uh, of the guidelines implementation plan, um, we do have the so-called privacy impact assessment, as, which is exactly what uh, the colleagues have just explained. So the privacy impact assessment is one of the steps that uh, uh, we are slowly trying to, to make as a cooperative standard operating procedures every time that country office should undertake. Uh, but not only country office, every, every entity or every function that is, um, that is about to collect and process personal data. So as part of this uh, PIA, uh, Privacy Impact Assessment, uh, which is designed, if you want, a bit along the lines of the risk register, the, the risk analysis risk register, but the, the elements that uh, we will ask country office to look at are social political context, uh, analysis of the actors that we know that we foresee can be interested in uh, accessing, requesting or seizing, unlawfully seizing our data, a legal landscape at country level, analysis of all the data flows that we are envisioning, uh, IT uh, security standards at country office, third party assessment. So you, we, we should do a due diligence with our third, par third parties. So service providers that we that we want to undertake to check whether they have minimum standards in place. And within all this, I mean, by doing all this, we should be able to highlight the major risks and determine whether we want to accept, uh, transfer, mitigate, or eliminate the, the, the risk. So uh, just to confirm that we are going along those lines corporate, at corporate level. Sure, go ahead, Jos. Sorry, I'll keep it really brief. I just, um, uh, and thanks, uh, Michaela. I just wanted to sort of follow up briefly there and, and say that um, while the focus on, on privacy is very much in place and, and privacy is one of the key um, um, sort of rights that we, that we need to keep in mind when designing mobile data collection and other data collection, I would uh, uh, um, sort of want to point out that Privacy is not the only risk here, right? So even without exposing an individual's personal information, uh, there can still be uh, risks to uh, entire groups or, or communities for which you don't need to know their names or their phone uh, their phone numbers. Um, so so there is um, there is other risks than just uh, risk to privacy, and there are some uh, publications on this, uh, including by uh, again the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, and then also um, a, a book that was uh, published last year by uh, Luciano Floridi and uh, Lynette Taylor about group privacy in a digital age. Um, so Luciano Floridi, Lynette Taylor for for our audience, uh, look it up, and uh, it's it's a it's a good read. Okay, great. Thanks so much to all the panelists that asked questions, I think, or that answered the questions. I think we'll have one quick follow-up question for the Iraq team based on the response you just provided. Um, the panel, some of the participants are interested in knowing, is the information from your service provider then put into a WFP database? Or what's that process look like? And how do you ensure that the data is well protected? So Iraq, uh, over to you for a, a final response. Let me know if that's clear. Thanks.
Yes, uh, thank you, Mervet. The the data is captured in uh, in ODK and then transferred to us. So uh, we have a database of that data on our servers, and um, and uh, we we are the final repository is with us. Over. Okay, great. Um, so in the element of time, um, first of all, I wanted to thank all of our panelists on multiple continents around the world for either waking up early or staying late at the office today to participate in our webinar. Um, for those of you that tuned in, thanks so much for your time. Um, like I said before, if we did not have a chance to answer your question, we promise we will do so. So please tune in to the MVAM blog, mvam.org, for further details. We'll also provide um, copies or links to some of the resources that Angie, Yoss, and other participants referenced during their talks. So thank you to everyone. Have a good rest of the day or a good evening. Um, on behalf of the World Food Program Vulnerability Analysis and Mapping Team, um, we wish you all the best. Thanks so much. Bye.